from the center of the universe and the home of your Grey Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos pregame walkthrough brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. My name is Ben Grant. I'm not joined by JB today. He's on vacation this week, but he will be back, I believe, for our uh, postgame reaction podcast after the Calgary game this week. And that is my job today is to get you set for the Toronto Argonauts taking on the Calgary Stampeders. We've got a huge show for you today because there's some breaking news just as I sit down to record the Toronto Argonauts have released Markeith Ambles, wide receiver, who is just uh, ready to be taken off the six-game injured list. So we'll get into that. There's also some PFF scores to go through. Chad Kelly threw at the first pitch at the Blue Jays game. I want to talk about the 1921 Toronto Argonauts because that is the only team left that this current team is chasing. I want to talk about the practice facilities, the team at Michael Power this week, plus give you an injury update, game preview, OCDC, one thing, predictions, put me down for 20, and CFL picks. All that more is coming up on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. Before I get into anything, I want to tell you a little bit about something in the water brewing, and I've got some Longboat right next to me here. Longboat Pale Ale is the beer made for you, Toronto Argonauts fans, made for fans of the double blue. And if you're planning to watch the game at home, maybe listen to Mike Hogan and I on 1050 Radio, sync it up to your TV. What better thing to have in the fridge than these double blue cans of Longboat Pale Ale from something in the water? It's a fantastic beer, but it's also football themed. It's Argos themed, right? You got X's and O's all over the can. It's the best can in, 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 the, in the beer industry at the moment. X's and O's all over the can. You've got Colonel Troutman there with his, uh, with his football helmet on, his blue football helmet. Uh, you can't beat it. And like I said, it's a fantastic beer. Get down to Liberty Village, go to something in the water, buy some beer, throw it in the fridge, and you're all set for Friday night's tilt against the Calgary Stampeders. So Markeith Ambles, wide receiver, the really the focal point of Toronto's offense last season in some ways was released by the Argonauts today. Uh, that's our lead story. That's the, the biggest thing to talk about. Um, this, this release has very little to do with Markeith Ambles himself. Um, Markeith is a great player. He's a player with a skill set that the Argos really don't have outside of him. And that's one reason this move caught me off guard because Coach Dinwiddie's offense last year was highly reliant on Markeith Ambles and what he could do. The change of direction that he had, the versatility that he had from jet sweeps to uh, to bang routes, whip routes. Uh, and that's something that when... He was put on the six-game injury list to start this season. I worried that the Argonauts would struggle because they don't really have another guy quite like that on the team. They put Cam Phillips in that spot, but they didn't ask him to do those same things. And my assumption all along had been, well, when Cam Phillips comes, sorry, when Marquis Thamels comes back to the team, he'll take over that spot. And then maybe Phillips will move over to the boundary slot. Maybe Tavares goes back out wide or, you know, who knows what happens. But the problem is they've got the problem is it's a good problem to have that they've, they've just got too many quality wide receivers, both Canadians and Americans. And I don't know what they're going to do about the Canadian spot. We'll get to that problem a little later in the show. But let's talk about the Americans first. With Markeith Ambles healthy and coming back, Demonte Coxey also healthy and coming back. Obviously, Jeremiah Hedell was was not going to be, well, I say obviously, I don't think Jeremiah Hedell would be dressing this week. I would imagine Coxey will go back to his spot at wide out if he's fully healthy. If not, then sure. But the other problem is after that, so what do you do? Who do you sit if you're going to dress Markeith Ambles? And there wasn't really a good answer. Like you're not going to, you're not going to say Coxey. Uh, he's been fantastic this year. He's been one of the, the best wide receivers Toronto's had. He's had a great rapport with Chad Kelly. Devaris Daniels is probably your, your highest skill level guy. Curly Gittins Jr. is a Canadian you're not moving in. He's one of the best Canadian receivers in the CFL, if not the best. Uh, Cam Phillips has done everything that's been asked of him and more. And he's got a really developing relationship with Chad Kelly. And then, the, you know, the other two Canadians, Unger and Brissett, are fighting it out for that one spot. 
And that's going to be a Canadian receiver spot going forward. I can't see the, the Argos just aren't built to do anything but really have those two Canadian receiver spots. And they've got way more than enough talent to fill them. So there's just not really another option. It would have meant either sitting Cam Phillips or sitting Marquise Ambles. One of those guys wasn't going to dress. And you're already not dressing Jeremiah Haydell, BJ Bird. You've got, you've got a, a wealth of, of talent at receiver. So someone had to go. Does it mean that Markeith is the least skilled of these guys? No, I don't think it does. But what it means is that you don't want to mess with what's working. So one of these guys has to go. Unfortunately, he's just sort of a, a victim of circumstance. And, and what happens here is you're not going to shake things up. You just don't risk it. The Argos, if if they were if they were two and two and five or what I can't do math, two and four at this stage, and that were the situation, and Markeith came back. Might you try something different? Might you try to work him back in? Sure. But the Argos are 6-0. and They're playing better football than anyone else in the CFL. There's no question about that. Their offense is as good as anyone's in the CFL. You don't mess with that. And so they're not going to suddenly sit Cam Phillips and put Markeith Ambles in. And you're not doing him any favors either. Like either of those guys, Cam Phillips, he, you know, he can't be on your bench either. And so someone had to go. It's Markeith Ambles. It's, it's sad. I hate it. I really like him as a player. I think he he was awesome last season. I also think he's going to get picked up in a hurry. Someone is going to take him because he's better than a, a bunch of different Americans that are starting right now. I, if I were Edmonton, I'd be all over him in a heartbeat. Uh, but I think there's going to be multiple teams uh, bidding for Marquise Amble's services. So uh, we'll have to stay tuned and see what happens. Again, this is just breaking. I haven't I haven't seen anything else about this. I haven't had a chance to talk to anyone about this. I'm just as surprised as as you probably were seeing this move. It, it makes sense, but it doesn't mean it's not surprising. Let's take a look at some of the PFF scores from this week. The Argos graded, I was going to say surprisingly well. It is surprisingly well on offense. Um because I didn't feel like their offense actually played that well. Now, I say that. When I went back to rewatch the game, uh, so I'll usually, whether I'm watching it in person or in this case, I was on vacation last week, I was watching it on the TV, I still go back and rewatch. And I'm pausing and I'm looking at specific things. I spend a lot more time looking at the, the O-line, for example. The offensive unit played a lot better football than I had originally thought. I came out of that game, look at the numbers, you know, Chad had just over 100 yards passing. They didn't have 100 yards rushing as a team. You're like, oh, the offense didn't really play that well. Truthfully, they actually executed pretty well. First of all, Saskatchewan's a pretty good football team. Not many people seem to know that. Uh, it's certainly not reflected in anyone's power rankings. They're talking about quarterback controversy and everything else. That's a good defense, and it's a really good offense, too. So... Saskatchewan played a role in the Argos not being dominant offensively. But the Argos were also up pretty quickly, 21-0. And they did take a foot off the gas a little bit. But they had some players that scored really well. So when you look at like the team scores on PFF for this week, the Argos, as vanilla as they may have been on offense last week, actually had the second best offensive grade in the league. Only the BC Lions were higher. And that's probably because they were going up against the Edmonton Elks. Defensively, Toronto also had the second best uh, numbers in the league. They came second to Montreal, who had a really good defensive game. They kept Calgary out of the end zone the entire game. Calgary with six field goals in that game. So yeah, that, that makes sense. And then on the season as a whole, Toronto has the second best offensive grade. Uh, it's a really strong 79.8 is a huge grade for just like, to, as a point of comparison, if you're not familiar with PFF, the Argos had 67.5 this week offensively, which was the second best number. So to have 79.8 on the season offensively is huge. The only team better than that on the season is Winnipeg with 81.5. So Toronto is like right on their tail. And then defensively, they got an 86.7, which is, is a huge number. And they only trail the BC Lions, who have 90.8. And that's because BC has got two shutouts against the Edmonton Elks. Again, not taking anything away from BC's defense. They're excellent. But I think if Toronto had played the Elks twice, <laughs> I, I think their, their PFF number would be good. Now, as I say that, 
the Elks put up 31 points on the Argos, but it was weird. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that kind of game. And actually Toronto graded fairly well on that. It's just the Elks were able to score on some, some unusual plays and some special team uh, support. So um, yeah, that's where the Argos stand on the season. Now the second best offense, second best defense on the week, the second best offense, second best defense, the best combined score, both on the week and overall in the season is pretty huge. And then to look at the PFF numbers for the week in terms of the all PFF team of the week, seven Toronto Argonauts made that unit, which tells you how well they played. AJ Olette makes it at running back. He actually had a really nice game in pass protection. He did some really good stuff. Like he ran the ball efficiently. He didn't have any huge explosive runs. It wasn't really that that kind of game for him. He was in the 40s in terms of total numbers, but he played a very solid football game, the kind of football game that grades very well, as you see. Uh, also on offense, two Toronto linemen, Darius Sirocco, who played a solid game, and Dejon Allen, who didn't let anybody near Chad Kelly, uh, was the right tackle of the week. So nice to have those two linemen and AJ on the offense. Three guys on the defensive side of the ball, Flo Romilade had a huge game. He was the edge rusher of the week. Wyndham McManus, I thought, had the best game of anybody on the Toronto Argonauts last week, so there's no surprise that he's on this team as well as halfback to Sean Amos, uh, who, of course, had that pick six. He played a heck of a game, too. So it's nice to see him getting recognized. And Javon Leak was the returner of the week. That's a no-brainer. He was, it's not even, even without his touchdown return, he might have been up there because he had a couple very nice returns last week uh, against the Rough Riders. Chad Kelly threw out the first pitch at the Toronto Blue Jays game last night. The reason this is a story is because the reaction to it was a lot bigger than I think we've seen Toronto Argonaut stories get in this city. So having somebody's quarterback or a star on somebody's football team throw the first pitch isn't unusual. You see it all the time. Joe Burrow, I think, was supposed to be throwing out a first pitch at the Reds game next week. I'm not sure that's actually happening because he's got a he's got a calf injury. But that's, you know, that's pretty typical. Your quarterback goes to the baseball team. Baseball players come to the to the you know football practice and they do a lot of kind of um uh, cross team mingling because it's it's cross promotion that's what it is and so you get stars from one team to promote the other team you especially do it in groups where the ownership is the same this is a little different here but yeah that part's not a surprise it's how many media outlets were covering that and what a big story that turned into a first pitch it isn't really a story you know chad chad did his thing he got out there in his in his blue jays jersey with kelly on the back number 12 threw a pitch, didn't, didn't gun it in there. I was kind of hoping he'd put a little heat on it, but again, he's not going to, you know, imagine he like threw out his arm or something, right? So he's not going to try and throw 90. I bet he could though. He ends up throwing, you know, a little off speed number, a little, a little high and inside maybe for a right-handed batter. Um, but yeah, he does his thing, waves to the crowd, gets a huge cheer. And then everybody is talking about that. And that doesn't usually happen to the Toronto Argonauts. That's why this is a big deal. I talked a few weeks ago about how there is way more buzz in the city of Toronto than there usually is about this team. That's continued to build. You've got, like, obviously TSN's doing their part. TSN Radio has got guest after guest uh, of the Argos week after week. Uh, obviously, they do have the the play-by-play -play that we do as well. And uh, TSN on TV, you're expecting to see a lot of CFL content, and you do, whether it's CFL Wired or, or replaying games, of course. They talk about it on, on SportsCenter, yes. But you've also got Sportsnet doing it. You've got the fan talking about it. You've got non-sports networks that have this as a story. They're showing Chad Kelly throwing at the first pitch. There is buzz in the city because this is a historically good team. And I'm going to talk about that in our next little segment here. But on that note, come out and watch this team. you got to come down to BMO Field to watch this team. They're special. It's a really good football team. Uh, they uh, have their next home game on August 13th against the Ottawa Red Blacks. Tickets are moving pretty well. I was actually looking this morning uh, at tickets. I'm, I've got some family members that I was going to get some tickets for for this game. And it's already getting pretty tight. So get on there. Go to the Argos website. Buy your tickets. Get down to the game. It's a special team to watch. It's always a great experience. It's great value. But this is a team that's performing at a historically high level. On that note, 
let's talk about the 1921 Toronto Argonauts. So the Argos are 6-0, and uh, which ties the two best starts in franchise history. And now the only team they're chasing is the 1921 Toronto Argonauts. I'm going to tell you, I can tell you a little bit about them. In some ways, it's going to be very tough to duplicate what they did because they went 6-0, and which was their entire season. So they finished an undefeated season. And then they went 3-0 and in the playoffs to win the Grey Cup. So to equal that, technically, I don't think it's the same as, like if they start 9-0, and I don't really think that's the same thing. I think to equal that team, they've got to run the table. They've got to go 18-0 and and win the Grey Cup. I think that's the only way you can best the 1921 Argos. But let's go one game at a time. So the Argos go 6-0 and in 1921. Their, their playoff run is so fun. Even their division, like they, it's, it's Toronto, Hamilton, Ottawa, and Montreal. But it's the Hamilton Tigers. It's the Ottawa Senators. And it's the Montreal AAA Winged Wheelers. Um, that's the division they won. They go into the playoffs. They beat the Toronto Varsity Blues 20 to 12, which I just love seeing that as a matchup. And then they go into the Eastern Final and beat the Toronto Parkdale Paddlers 16 to 8, a tight game at Varsity Stadium. And then the Grey Cups played at Varsity Stadium as well. That's against Edmonton, and they win that game 23 0. I love <laughs> I love that. I love that it's a tighter game against the Parkdale Paddlers than it is against Edmonton in the Grey Cup. It just sort of tells you what football was in 1921. Like the teams you've got playing uh, across the country. Um, you know, last week I did a bit on all the different divisions that were in Ontario. It's just it was hard to get out of Ontario alone, uh, let alone uh, win the Grey Cup. But that's that 1921 team is is going to be hard to beat. Toronto's got a ways to go this season, but. Um, in terms of setting records, if they can beat Calgary this week and go 7-0, and they will be the only team in franchise history to start a regular season 7-0 and because that's something the 1921 Argonauts never had a chance to do. I want to talk about the practice facilities for the Argos this week. It, it was a sort of a weird scenario. So Caravan is going on in the city or preparations for Caravan are going on in the city and Lamport Stadium because of that is unavailable. I believe it's being used as a sort of a hosting venue as a, as a starting point or something like that. And so the Argos were forced to go on the road for practice. That's not something that's new to them. They've done this before. But often they'll choose to practice at Centennial Stadium when this is the case. Uh, and they didn't this week. They're practicing this week close to Centennial Stadium, but it's not Centennial Stadium. It's Michael Power uh, High School. It's a great field, really nice facility at Power, but it's not what they're used to. And this does factor in a little bit. I don't think it's a huge deal, but it is still an extra hurdle that this team has to deal with. Remember, this this Toronto Argonauts team has not played at home in a month. Right? This it's it's been a long time since the Argos had a home game at BMO Field. They're because of the touchdown Atlantic counting as a home game, you've essentially got a over a month of, of football on the road. So you're dealing with that. You're dealing with what's going to be a tough game this week in Calgary at McMahon Stadium. And you add to that that they're not even practicing in their regular facility. It's just a lot of obstacles. But this team has shown the ability to overcome them. Uh, some things just from even from practice today, just showing you uh, how a different facility can change things. Uh, watching Dejan Brissett today, he was he was running a corner route, uh, juggled the ball as he was going out of bounds in the corner of the end zone. He was going at, like flat out to try and get to this football. And he ends up going not only out of the end zone and off the track, he then goes tumbling down a hill, uh, which is located right next to the end zone, and then disappears into a thick of pine trees and is gone, has vanished. And I was just sitting, I've got, I've got my little chair set up uh, and I was just sitting a, a few yards away from where he vanished. And so I got up out of my feet. I'm like, I, I hope he's okay. Like, they're, they're like, you know, neighbors, fences and things down there. You couldn't even see where he disappeared to. And the rest of the receivers are like, where, like, where, 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 where does that go? Um, and uh, there are all sorts of jokes being made. Like he's gone, he's not coming back. And I, and I was just worried that he, he was hurt, but I didn't hear any like calling for help. And then about a minute later, he reemerged through the pine trees, you know, covered in, in pine needles and everything else. 
but uh, you know, with the football. But that's something that doesn't happen, obviously, at Lamport Stadium. And and I laugh about it, but it's lucky he wasn't hurt. He very easily could have been because he's just not, he's practicing in a place that he's not used to. And you don't want to put a professional football team through that if you can avoid it. There's not many stadiums where you're going to go out of bounds and roll down a hill into pine trees. But that's the nature of high school fields. And again, it's a great facility at, at Michael Power, but it's just something that uh, that you, you were not really counting on. You don't want players thinking about that. You want them worrying about the plays. You want them worrying about their, their job and, and not having to think about personal safety when you're when you're at practice it's a fantastic facility for fans uh, now I personally hate it because there's no elevation when I watch practice at Lamport I sit at the very top I will often go stand in the corners if I want uh, a vantage point if I want to kind of see you know the equivalent of like tight film if I want to see line play I'll stand in the corner of the stadium on the very top row uh, I'll often sit at midfield in the very top row just to kind of see every station during Indy, during um, during uh, early outs or whatever, just to see who's working on what. I can't do any of that at Michael Power because it's all on ground level. So I have trouble seeing the sort of X's and O's side of things. So I don't like it from that point of view. For fans, it's great. Uh, fans that came out to watch practice yesterday and today loved it because they're right there. You're just you're. You're a few feet away from players. Uh, the whole practice is like that. Um, there's just not, it, you know, it's a, it's a high, it's it looks like every other high school stadium except it's got a beautiful turf field to it. But uh, yeah, it's a wonderful place to come and watch uh, practice as a fan. So it was really cool to see a lot of fans taking advantage of that and and showing up these last two days. Uh, the other thing that you can't do and maybe could be perceived as a disadvantage is they don't have their sound system. And so no music at practice the last couple of days, which you never see with the Argos. They love their music. They've got music blasting typically going station to station during warm up, uh, during stretches. And, you know, there's dancing and there's they're singing along. It's a part of who this team is. It's sort of part of how this 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 team's identity. And they weren't able to do that uh, the last couple of days, which I, I, you know, you hate to see something change up like that because it's obviously a positive. It's an energy builder. But they also were unable to pump in crowd noise. That's something that you typically would do. And the Argos typically do uh, leading up to an away game. They do pump in crowd noise. Now, the reason I don't think the crowd noise part is a big deal uh, is I'm not really a believer in that. I actually think it's a detriment to do that. I understand why some teams do it. But even the Argos, when they do it, it's not like... A couple of years ago, the Argos used to blast crowd noise at Lamport. Like, it was deafening. Like I, I would cover my ears when the crowd noise was being blasted, and it was so loud. And they they don't do it quite to that volume. Like, this year when they've done crowd noise, it's actually been pretty quiet. And I think that's a better way to do it. You have the sound as a reminder. Oh, yeah, let's communicate non-verbally. But it still allows coaches to communicate if need be. And that's not only like a player safety issue, it's just a practice efficiency issue. You want coaches to be able to stop a play suddenly, blow something dead if they see something they don't like, correct something, and or um, be able to communicate to each other as they're watching what's going on and watching the players communicate with each other non-verbally. So leading up to a game in Calgary, Yes, obviously you want to go through all of the nonverbal stuff. It's it's less a big deal at McMahon than it is at at Mosaic, just because Calgary is way more open air. It, like Mosaic's got you know crowd all the way around you. It's a it's just a much louder stadium, and I'm, I'm not talking about like numbers, just the way the stadium is built. Um, but you still want to go through that. You still want to be able to run uh, without verbal communication on any road game. But you don't need crowd noise to do that. You can just tell your players, okay, we're going silent. And then you can run your 12 is completely silent. But without the crowd noise blasting, coaches can now stop something or yell in a reminder or talk to each other and say, hey, can you watch this? Or, or did you see that? Let's correct this after this play. So uh, to me, that's not a big deal. But it's different. And anything different, anything that takes you out of the routine, I think is worth bringing up. Let's get into the injury update. This is a huge one for the Argos. I couldn't, I knew what was happening leading up to this week, but I couldn't really believe the number of healthy bodies that were running around at practice uh, these last two days. It's, it's pretty unbelievable when you think about how well the Argos are doing how strong the start of their season has gone 
and yet you've got all these guys that are still that are still coming back right like guys that are guys that are starters typically guys that have gone into uh the season where we're thinking okay the Argos are going to really need to count on this guy but they've been on the six game list and suddenly you've got these guys coming back so we talked about Markeith Ambles as being a, a guy that was a victim of that there are going to be some other really tough decisions coming up and I want to go through the list here to sort of uh, I guess highlight how difficult this is going to be. So just from today's practice alone, I'll I'll go through non-linemen and non-receivers first because I want to really focus in on those two positional groups separately. So running back Daniel Adeboboye was able to practice full today. That's obviously a huge sign. Uh, We know Maurice Carnell is still out. That's that's not going to change for the time being. He's obviously still, still rehabbing from that knee injury. Uh, Thomas Costigan is able to go full the last two days. I would expect him to rejoin the team. Uh, Josh Haggerty has been able to go full. Uh, it would be surprising if he doesn't work his way back in there. Remember how valuable Josh Haggerty was on special teams last season, not to mention how valuable he is as a safety, but he was a special team stud last year. So he'll be a guy they want to get back into the mix quickly. Um, and then... Uh, Benoit Marion, after not going full yesterday, was able to go full today. That's a good sign. Uh, Tavares McFadden is able to go full each of the last two days. Enoch Mwamba is still re- rehabbing the knee. He's he's going to be out. Um, hasn't practiced the last couple days. Spencer Nichols hasn't practiced yet this week. That is a little concerning, especially because I have I have plans for fullbacks this week that'll come up in OCDC. I'll get to that. Uh, and uh, and then everybody else is either a receiver or an offensive lineman. And that's where things get really interesting. So let's start with receivers. Demonte Coxey, healthy, uh, has practiced each of the last two uh, practices and has gone full. Tommy Neald, healthy, has practiced each of the last two practices, has gone full. Look at that receiver room for a second. You have to assume Coxey is going to come back in and Haydell will come out. It's a little less busy with having released Markeith Ambles, but it's still pretty crowded. Haydell is a great player. BJ Bird is begging to get on that roster, on that dress roster, because he, he's he's good. He looks great in practice. He's a good player. You saw him preseason, what he could do. Remember, his preseason game against Hamilton was dynamic. And then on the Canadian side, uh, I don't I don't know the answer. I don't have an answer. It's not it's not a good situation in the sense that you know you don't want guys that are as good as Tommy Neald, as good as Dejan Brissett, uh, playing as well as David Unger, these guys should not be sitting. They should be dressed. And you can't dress all four of Gittins Jr., Unger, Brissett, and Neald. I, I, I guess you can. I don't think they're going to. I think that's... I. I I think you're you're not really doing justice to your full roster if you do it that way. But at the same time, I don't know what you do about that situation. I think given that Neil is just coming off an injury, maybe you give it another week. But if you feel like it's a situation where, like if you feel Tommy Neal has been healthy for a few weeks now and you were just waiting till he's off the sixth game and he's fully ready to go, fully recovered, and I kind of think he is, then I sort of think he has to get in there. He looked better than any other Canadian receiver in preseason, in camp. He looked amazing. And if he has the kind of rapport with Chad Kelly now that he did preseason during training camp, I feel like you have to find a way to get him on the field, not just dressed, on the field. And Curly Gittins Jr. is obviously taking up one of those spots. It's a weird scenario because... I think Neil is actually better in that slot back spot than he is at wide. I don't actually really like him as as a uh, like as a split end as as a Z. Whereas I think Brissett and Unger do fit that spot better. I just don't know how you balance it, and I don't know how you make the decision to sit Unger or Brissett. Brissett is you know he's made some tremendous catches. He's such a red zone asset. You saw it last week in Touchdown Atlantic with the the touchdown and the two point conversion that he got. He's made some heroic catches. And then Ungerer has had two really big games. The two touchdown game in Montreal. He had that great game against Edmonton. What do you do? Which of those three guys do you sit? And and I don't know the answer to that. I don't envy 
uh, the Argos coaching staff having to make that decision. But like I say to fans who ask me, like, who's going to who's going to start, who's going to sit, who's going to who's going to dress? It's better to have this problem than to have the problem that a lot of teams in the league do right now, where they're like, who are we going to get to play this spot? Who are we going to get to play Z? Who are we going to get to play left left tackle? The Argos don't have that situation. So that uh, that's the receiver scenario. Let's talk about the offensive line scenario. This is an issue too. So Darius Bladek practiced full today and yesterday. And remember, Darius, if he's not the best lineman on the Toronto Argonauts, is the second best lineman on the Toronto Argonauts. And that's saying something because this is a really good line. Ryan Hunter is excellent. Peter Nicastro is excellent. Soraka was is playing his head off this year. Um, Travion Tate has been playing well. Isaiah Cage is good. Like I think Dejon Allen is probably he's probably the best Argos lineman. I think I'd have Bladex second, even even still, even with as well as the rest of the guys are playing. So hold that thought. Let's get to the rest of the O line. Isaiah Cage practiced last week. Was able to go full last week, and I thought it was correct to sit him out of touchdown Atlantic. But he's been able to practice full this week too, yesterday and today. Do you sit him again? Is that is that fair? Is that the right thing to do? Trayvon Tate's been playing great, but Isaiah Cage lost his job due to injury. He's been able to practice for two weeks now. Don't you want to put him back in there? And I think I think I do. I think I would. That would be that would be my thought uh, for this week. But I, I don't think the Argos are going to roll with it that way. I would expect them to to sit on it a little bit. The the thing with Cage is he's had a few years where injuries have been an issue. We know how strong a player he is. If you if if Tate's playing as well as he is, I think they're going to see it as let's just keep going with this. Um, let's keep going with what we've got. Let's not disrupt things. And and I do get that mentality. But again, Bladeck Cage, uh, and uh, we got to add in Shane Richards too. So Shane Richards was able to practice full yesterday and today, and he's such a value because I, I don't think he's I don't think Richards I don't really know if I see him fighting for a starting spot. He certainly could. Like he, you certainly could look at him as a starting left tackle. But I think they'd sooner put Cage. And, and Tate in there. Why Richards is so valuable is that he can back up at both tackle and guard and is a Canadian. And so it, he's checking a lot of boxes there. His value is huge. And so I kind of do think that Richards will dress this week. I don't think he'll start, but I think he'll be one of the backups because it's great to be able to have, they've got the flexibility at center. You know, they've got Sirocco can play center, Nicastro can play center. Uh, they've got uh, Ryan Hunter can also play center in a pinch if really need be. Um, but other than that, you know, once you start moving pieces around, it's great to be able to have your guys on the bench who can play both guard and tackle. And so Richards uh, does that and can replace a Canadian without it without it uh, interfering with your your ratio issue. So what are they going to do there? No idea. No, no idea. I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see Friday. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know where you begin to, to figure out that scenario. I think the conservative way of doing it is you sit Bladek for another week, you sit Cage for another week, you dress Richards as a backup, uh, maybe use him in some um, some tight end packages, but that's about it. And I, th- I think that's probably what they do. They've been conservative so far this year with injuries. They haven't rushed anyone back. So that would be my guess. But it's not an easy decision, especially with especially with Bladeck. All right, let's get into a game preview. Excuse the silence while I just have a, a sip of my Longboat Pale Ale for a second here. You know how much I appreciate JB, but even more so with the um, the fact that he he gives me a chance to rest for a second, collect my thoughts. I have no idea what I'm what I'm saying here. I'm I'm sure I'm rambling and ranting, but. Um, We'll have JB back soon for for the next podcast, I believe. Uh, Let me get into a game preview. So what does this game mean to the Argonauts? What does this game mean to the Stampeders? The Argonauts can afford to lose this game. Yes, they're 6-0. They have three games. The uh, the rest of the division has three wins. They have six. They've got a three-game lead over the next closest team. Uh, And a game in hand uh, over, I think, everybody. So they're in a great spot. That said... What you're playing for right now and why you desperately want to win this game this week is the more wins you can stock up now, the earlier you can shut it down in the fall. Remember, the the Argos have a gauntlet to run in the fall. 
they've got their last of three buys coming up in a couple of weeks time in August. And that's it. And then they've got to run all the way through till playoffs without a buy. They're the only team in that scenario. And that's a tough stretch. You know, you've got games at Winnipeg, you've got you've got Labor Day class, you've got Thanksgiving. There's a, there's there's a bunch of tough games coming up. So as much distance as the Argos can create now affords them opportunities later to kind of create their own buy. Just like we saw Winnipeg do last few seasons, we saw Hamilton do it a couple years ago. If you can go into the last two weeks of the season already having clinched your division, now you've got a luxury. Number one, you can rest whoever you want to rest. Anyone you just don't want out there, you don't want to risk getting hurt. Anyone even slightly banged up, and there will be guys slightly banged up, just sit them, rest them. And then on top of that, from an X's and O's point of view, you don't have to show a thing. You've got other teams fighting for their lives, showing you the best plays they've got, the things they've been saving and sitting on. They've got to empty it and show you everything. You, meanwhile, if you you can run, you can run like, you know, power leads all day long. And that's it. You run two different plays if you wanted to. It'd be terrible football, obviously. But you don't need to do anything. There's no pressure. You don't show a thing. Or you can you can feed misinformation. You can do whatever you want. And that's a huge luxury to have going to the playoffs. So that's why the Argos want to win this game. You want to keep the streak going. You want to keep the momentum going. But it's mostly for later so that you have options down the road. So that's the importance for the Argos. For the Stampeders, this is kind of as close to a must-win game as you can have in early August. Uh, they're in a mess. You look at the you look at the standings for uh, for the Calgary Stampeders. They've got two wins right now. They're only two games up on the Edmonton Elks. Remember that. Like the Elks win this week, the Stamps lose. Suddenly, they're they're battling it out with the Elks for last place in the West. And this is the Calgary Stampeders we're talking about. A team that hasn't missed the playoffs since like the 1700s. And they're in a mess. They need to win this week. It's a tough place to play for Toronto. Remember what happened last year? I remember I remember that trip very well. I did not go well for the Argos. The only good thing that came out of that trip was is the first game where the Argos were actually able to run the ball effectively last season. Obviously, that's not an issue this year, but it, it's it's not a great place for the Argos to play. Historically, they haven't done very well there. Last year, they scored two points offensively. They looked terrible. Uh, Wyndham McManus got hurt in that game. It was a, almost everything that could have gone wrong did go wrong in that game. And walking back in there is going to be tough. What makes it, you know, with the extra motivation, I suppose, from that uh, is you've got a lot of Calgary ties on this Argos team. That's been talked about a lot, obviously. Uh, coaching staff, players, and they were embarrassed last season. Going to McMahon in October, it was embarrassing. And that loss, I'm sure, stuck with them. And I'm sure they've been talking about it this week. Like, we're not going to let that happen again. And so that's where you're going to see that extra little bit. If there, if there is such thing as that, obviously this hasn't been a team that's needed uh, or that's been lacking motivation. Their 1-0 philosophy has done them well through six games. I think this might be the toughest game they have all year because of how desperate Calgary is. They're going to throw everything at them. And I wouldn't rule anything out. You're going to see you're going to see Calgary run fake punts, fake field goals, flea flickers, um onside punts, anything they're sitting on, you'll see in this game if there's an opportunity to run it because they can't afford to to lose. They will bring Toronto everything they've got. And anyone that's even close to being healthy is going to play uh, because they they're not in a position that Toronto's in. It's time for OCDC. OCDC is brought to you by the Business Barbershop and Spa. The Business Barbershop and Spa invites you to experience Etobicoke's premier licensed men's grooming lounge for hair, face, and body care, celebrating 10 years in the Kingsway. And the, the any client that goes down to the Business Barbershop and Spa is entered to win a $200 gift card. All you got to do is mention Argo's All About the Business. It is a fantastic place to get your hair cut, get a shave, get a spa treatment. Uh, I've been going there for years. It's right off Royal York Subway. It's really easy to get to. You leave there feeling like a million bucks and you're totally taken care of. Right from the moment 
you book your appointment. You can book your appointment through text. It's, it's, they, they couldn't make it easier. So if you get a chance, visit the business barbershop and spa. I know a bunch of you already have, and that's fantastic. I love that, that you guys are so supportive of our sponsors. If you haven't got down there yet, you've absolutely got to do it. The business barbershop and spa uh, in the Kingsway. All right, with no JB this week, this is a lot of pressure. I'm just going to grab a quick drink here before I run into this segment. I have been a lot of things in my coaching career. I have never been a defensive coordinator. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it, it puts me in a, a tougher spot this week as I try to fill JB's shoes. But I will run both offense and defense for both teams in this segment as I look through my extensive notes here. So let's start with the Calgary offense. So Calgary offensively, I want them to get away from running inside zone. If I'm if I'm the offensive coordinator for the Calgary Stampeders, I actually want to run a lot more sort of gap based or man based blocking assignments. And I want this. <laughs> this is going to sound like misinformation. I want to run right at Jared Brinkman if he's playing. If Brinkman's not playing, I want to run right at Hendricks. That's my plan offensively. Now this sounds foolish, but let me give you my rationale for it. This is something that I did actually a lot as a coach as well. Anytime I go up against a player with a stud on the interior, a guy that was completely shutting down other teams' run games, I'd watch the film like, how are we gonna, how are we gonna run with this guy there? One of the best solutions I've found often is running right at them. Uh, it's, it helps because you're setting up double teams. Um, they're often sitting in the gap that you're targeting. Great, let's let's run to that gap. So you double team it and it takes away a strength. Often players, and you see this with Brinkman, part of the reason he's so good in the run game, he makes plays laterally. You know, he'll beat his guy and teams don't typically run right at him and he's able to slide and make the tackle. You see Hendricks do it a lot too. And so I think run into that strength, force them to take it head on. It's more difficult and they're going to have to take on double teams to do it. The one caveat here is often with this type of blocking scheme, you leave the ends, especially if you're running middle, you're running like zero or or, or one, um, a two gap. Uh, you'll leave the ends unblocked. You can't leave Flo or Milade unblocked. He's too fast. He's going to get around the side. So I block Flo. You can leave whichever end is to the other side as you sort of power your way up the middle. But that's, that's how I'm going to start for Calgary. And I want to run these out of pistol so that I can get uh, Mayer running on a naked boot after that. So he hands off the ball, runs on a naked boot. And I'm going to be watching that from the booth. And as soon as they stop paying attention to Mayer, that's when I'm going to start running uh, flood routes, uh, passing routes to that side, get three receivers flooding to that side, to those zones, and give Mayer the option to run. I think he's actually going to need to use his feet in this game. That's something that it's an X factor. Again, I don't want to put quarterbacks in harm's way. I just wrote an article about that on Three Down Nation. It's so important to protect quarterbacks. I think Mayer's going to have to run this week. Hopefully he's got the sense to slide and get down, not take hits. But I think he's not an overly fast quarterback. He's not really a runner. I think he might have to be this week. Just see if the Argos are accounting for him defensively. Uh, and that's that's most of my plan. The last part of it is in the regular passing game, in their drop back passing game against Montreal last week, they brought in a lot of help when Montreal showed blitz. They sometimes even brought in like Bagleton to, to help pick up blitzes. I actually think you go the opposite way in this game. I don't bring in anyone else. If Toronto's going to blitz and send more guys than I can block, so be it. I'm not going to bring in more help. Instead, I'm going to make sure we build in enough hots and enough site adjustments to every one of our passing concepts. And that's where I'm going to go instead. So if you're bringing six and I've only got five blocking, that's fine. Let's just make sure we pick up the right five. And I'm going to be looking for my hots and my site adjustments and see if they can make plays after the catch. Um, on top of this, you know, the regular uh concepts you want to bring in you're expecting to see the Argonauts run a lot of their cover four so you run mesh concepts with the 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 stamps do that anyway the sort of like you know two crossing routes over the middle uh run some option routes for for Odom's Dukes I, those are your kinds of things that you're going to rely on as staples and that'd be my Calgary plan coming into this game for the Stampeders defensively what like how do you stop the Toronto Argonauts offense uh, you don't, but you can take some things away or at least try to. I think, first of all, you want to do what Saskatchewan did last week in defending the run. Uh, they didn't stop the run, but they did limit the run. Um, run blitzing. 
Uh, don't be too aggressive in your blitzing, not the way that you pass blitz. I think instead you're looking for gap control and that's how you try and slow down the Argonauts rushing attack. That's a really important step. In terms of passing defense, you want to try and make everything look like man for as long as you can. And sometimes there's formations and motions where you can't keep up that charade, but you want to make it look like man defense for as long as you can. Make Chad Kelly believe he's going to see man until the snap of the ball. Now, I don't want you to actually run man though, because the Argos are going to crush that. They they did against BC. BC threw a ton of man at them and Toronto ate it up. They're going to. They're the receivers can get a step of separation and Chad Kelly's so accurate that all he needs is a step. So you're going to have to run man sometimes, but not a lot. Make everything look like man. Make Kelly go to his second and third reads. Make him think for a second. Make him think, okay, I've got the corner out here and then suddenly, oh, it's not man. Okay, where's my where's my second? Where's my third? That's that's a way to get in Kelly's head a little bit, maybe. Um, it hasn't worked yet, but again, you're throwing new stuff at him every week, trying to find something that he can't do. And I haven't really seen a team give their full effort at that yet. So that's what I do if I'm Calgary's D. Flipping to the good guys. Uh, for Toronto's offense, I want to see double tight. Montreal did it last week for a couple plays. They got away from it. They ran double tight and they were just running inside zone runs. Nothing fancy. And uh, Stanback was was awesome out of those and then they went away from it they never went back to it so i i know there's some injury questions uh with spencer nichols i, I don't know if he's gonna be able to play or not this week but you can run double tight with your seven linemen toronto always dresses seven linemen get them all out there in the double tight run run them as eligibles um and i don't care if calgary knows you're running that's a, a place that i think they're vulnerable i don't think they're great at stopping power runs like that so get out there with your heavy set get out there with your seven linemen and Olette and Harris, not every play. I was, I'm not saying like run double tight eye the whole game. That's, I would not like watching that. But do it sometimes. Do it in crucial moments. Wear down that Calgary D. I think you have a personnel advantage if you're running out of those sets. So that's step one. Number two, um, when you're running your regular passing offense, I think the Argos are going to see a lot of cover three, especially on first down with, with the, the low defenders playing as tight to the line of scrimmage as they can. They're going to be there as run support. They're going to do everything they can to help stop that run. So you're going to see corners playing like on the line of scrimmage, pressing out of their cover three. And that opens up some gaps behind them. There's going to be quite a void, I think, between the flats defenders and the and the deep third defenders on the sidelines. And so bring out your concepts that attack those areas. So that's your, your you know, your your dragon concepts, your, your curl flats, anything that pins the flats defender to the line of scrimmage and has an option just behind them as well. So those are that's one good way to attack it. Uh, four verts, that's another great way to attack it. Have two guys running up the seams, two guys on the outside. You can have reads out of those as well. There's so many different ways to run four verts. That's what I like too. And the last thing is uh, use your running backs as receivers out of the backfield. Calgary actually covered that well last week against Montreal, but they haven't uh, this season. It hasn't been an area, like I, I thought Montreal actually had a really good game plan last week. They were clearly trying to uh, pass to uh, Sandback out of the backfield. Calgary had that covered, but it's not like Montreal was just pulling this out of thin air. They saw it on film. There is vulnerability there. There's one play where uh, Sandback uh, starts in the backfield to Fajardo's right, he ran a wheel route up the right rail. It was covered, but that kind of play has been open all season long against Calgary. It hasn't always been hit, but it's been there. And so find that, you know, get Olet to leak out into the flats, you know, look like he's pass protecting and then leak out, not like with screen blocking, but with a similar kind of action. And I think you're going to find that the running backs get left alone. I think that is a vulnerability um, to Calgary's defense. For Toronto's D, Play a lot of man. Montreal did it last week. They played a ton of man coverage. Play man coverage. Calgary didn't look very good against it. Mayer doesn't like when he doesn't have a read to make. It forces him to be really accurate. And he's kind of struggled with that. Anything from the mid to deep range. His short accuracy has been great. He's been off downfield. So force him to try and make those, those accurate throws. Because he hasn't shown it yet. And if he does, he starts beating you up. Then you can adjust. You can go back to what you're comfortable with. The one problem is Toronto's not great at man. It's not really their thing. They don't play a lot of it. Um, I, I really think they should try it out this week. I think 
there are a couple matchup issues, but not many. Like their DBs, well, it's not the best thing they do. It's not like they can't. And so that would be one thing I want to see a lot this week. And then you you have the luxury of having a really good three-man rush. So like in second and long situations, send a three-man rush and then play like man two. So you're you're like man coverage across the board. You got two deep and you can have a spy on Mare. And Mare struggled against Montreal's spy last week. They only ran it on a few plays. But the reason that he struggled is because that spy, knowing that like Mare's not taking out, he's not like a 4-4 guy or anything like that. And so that spy was just able to close. And even though it was the three-man rush, he'd suddenly really speed up uh, Mare's, um, Mare's time in the pocket. So that's a luxury that Toronto has. That three-man rush is effective. Have a spy and the three-man rush and you run cover two men and behind it. He's going to struggle. If you get the more second and longs you can call somebody like, like that on, um, the more Calgary is going to have a tough time. One thing, my one thing this week, hold to one turnover or less. The Argos cannot commit a lot of turnovers. This is a game they should dominate on paper. And I don't think it's going to work out that way. I don't think it's going to be a blowout win. But the way that Calgary gets in this game, either they hit big special teams plays, trick plays, or Toronto turns the ball over and Calgary is able to generate points off that. Take care of the football. One turnover is fine. Any more than that, and you're risking this game getting away. And so Toronto's just got to play smart, responsible football. Let it be decided in offense and defense um, in terms of moving the ball, scoring points, not turnovers, not big plays, not trick plays, not weather uh, knocking on wood, I haven't actually seen the forecast. Uh, if they do that, they should win this football game. So one turnover or less. That's my one thing. And a prediction for this game, uh, I think it's going to be low scoring, uh, which Toronto has not done yet this year. I've I've forecasted a few low scoring games. And none of them have, have been right. I think this is a low scoring game. I think Toronto wins at 20 to 16. I do think it's going to come down to the wire. I think Calgary's got the ball late driving. And I think the Toronto defense is, is just too, too good. Calgary had trouble getting in the end zone last week. Six field goals. I think they scored against Montreal. No touchdowns. Toronto's defense is better than Montreal's. Um, and I, I think Calgary plays against Toronto very well. I think they've got a good sense of Coach Dinwiddie's offense. Um, I think some of, it's, some of it's very familiar to them. And so... I do expect this to be a tight game. Toronto wins 2016. Put me down for 20. While gambling can be a fun way to enhance your sports viewing experience, it's important to do so responsibly. Make sure you set a budget. Never bet more than you're happy to lose. And if you know anyone that has developed a gambling problem, you can always call the Ontario Problem Gambling Helpline 1-888-230-3505. And definitely don't listen to us. Uh, you know, with a if you if money is important to you, do not follow our advice. JB is the poster boy for that. He's he's doing really well with his his picks, but with his this betting segment, this put me down for twenty. He is he's lost eleven straight bets, which is really actually quite hard to do. Uh, and so we started. We both started with two hundred golden fleeces. JB is down to one hundred four. Um, I'm in the green at the moment at 286 and a bit of change. Uh, last week I won on Hamilton plus 150 outright. And then I got blown away on my Sean Bain under 55 yards. He had, he had like a hundred yards at halftime, I think. Uh, so uh, coming to this one, um, I, I'm playing with a little bit of house money. I'm not going super aggressive though. Uh, I'm going to put 15 golden fleeces on Saskatchewan at even money to win uh, the game. I think they're going to beat Ottawa by double digits. I think they're a much better team. I think their quarterbacks are way better than anyone has given them credit for. And I think that I'm not saying that I'm not saying that, you know, it's, it's midnight and Dustin Crum has turned back into a pumpkin. I don't think we're quite there yet to be able to decide that. But I do think that Ottawa is at a place where Dustin Crum is going to have to show that he can win the game from the pocket. I don't think the way he was able to beat Winnipeg, the way he's been able to string a couple wins together, I don't think that's going to work this week against Saskatchewan. That's a good defense. They're going to be ready for it. There's a ton of film to go off. Uh, I think Ottawa is going to have a lot of trouble scoring points. And I think the Saskatchewan offense is good, even even with Fine and, and Dola Gala. Uh, I don't, I'm not really worried about that. So that's my 15 golden fleeces. 
My other five, I'm taking the Toronto Calgary game under 50 and a half uh, for five golden fleeces. I just, I don't know, I'll probably get burned by this again, but I just see this as a low scoring game. So that is my bet. Um, JB will get his picks in. Uh, I think he's going to email me his his picks before the games go tomorrow. So I'll see if I can post them on the from the X's and Argos Twitter account so you will know what not to bet. Um, but uh, yeah, he's at some point, things are going to turn around for him. He's going to go on a hot streak here. It's time for our CFL picks. And here, JB is doing well. He was 3-1 and one last week. I was 4-0 and oh last week, so I've actually caught up. We were both sitting at 20 wins and 11 losses on the season. We're, yeah, both laughing at the moment. And I like all four of these games this week, too. So BC at Winnipeg. I've got Winnipeg. I, I think Winnipeg at home is not going to lose again to the BC Lions, especially coming off a bye. Uh, I'm not too worried about the BC quarterback situation. I think Evans and Adams are are pretty similar. I think Adams gives you better, uh, maybe higher ceiling. But I think I think Evans um, played a really responsible football game last week. I think if he can do that again, that's that's not why Winnipeg's going to win this game. I think it's the extra prep time. It makes a difference. BC going back to back weeks on the road. I like the Bombers. Close one though. Toronto's going to beat Calgary. I already said that one. Uh, I think Hamilton. Uh, loses to the Montreal Alouettes. I would take Montreal on that one. I think they've got a better quarterback. Hamilton still, to me, has a has a better team than Montreal. I, I still don't love the Alouettes team. I don't really know how they're doing as well as they are in some ways, but they're getting good quarterback play from Cody Fajardo, and that matters a lot in this league. And I think Fajardo is a better quarterback than Powell. And so I see the Alouettes winning this. And then Ottawa, Saskatchewan, I already told you, I think Saskatchewan runs away with that one. So that is it for my CFL picks. Well, that is just about going to do it for us on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. It's Calgary, Toronto, 9 o'clock Eastern. You can catch the pregame show on TSN Radio with Mike Hogan and myself a Friday night. Make sure you get your something in the water, a longboat pale ale, stock your fridge with it, and you'll be all set for the Stampeders game, Toronto, Calgary at McMahon, 9 o'clock Friday night. For the vacationing JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya. Go Toronto Argos, go, go, go. Pull together, fight